You are on board with the This Week in Amateur Radio podcast, now in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1203 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Dayton Hamvention Organizing Committee announces the 2022 Hamvention Award winners. We will have team coverage. CQ Communications has limited contest participation by amateurs in Russia, Belarus, and elsewhere. We will have the full story. A grassroots effort to broadcast news and information into the Ukraine and Russia is taking place from shortwave stations right here in the United States. The Russians agree to give a ride home to a U.S. astronaut due to leave the space station, this despite current tensions. The Spectrum regulator in Belgium has announced it will utilize the 6-meter band during an upcoming military exercise. With heightened tensions around the world, the use of over-the-horizon radars is on the increase in the HF bands. The annual Friedrichshafen Hamfest in Germany, the largest in Europe, has announced it will be taking place in person this year. Meanwhile, the annual Friedrichshafen Youth Amateur Radio Camp has canceled this year's gathering due to COVID outbreaks. And an amateur radio club at a school in Ohio is transmitting wisdom over the air from its student amateur radio club. We will have all the details on this and a lot more on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the latest Apple event and their new series of processors. And he will take a look at their new monitor that has a iPhone Bionic CPU in it, but he doesn't know why it's there. And he will take a look at the current state of cyber warfare. He will have an expanded report this week. Australia's own Otto Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will present an introduction to the terms of contesting. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a look at a rare RF phenomenon called long-delayed echoes. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, presents part three of his six-part series explaining how to get your club meeting, or Hamfest, promoted on local broadcast radio by correctly composing and submitting a public service announcement. And we will have the latest activity of Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air with the February wrap-up from POTA coordinator Vance Martin, N3VEM. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from the area of depressed activity, just a little bit east of Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau, just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our amateur radio studios in the Catskills of New York State, where we're miring in the mediocrity of a muddy driveway, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, where the new morning commute terror is ice fog. I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where one day feels like spring and the next one like winter. Let's move on. There's nothing to see here. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, Chairman of the Hamvention Awards Committee, Michael Calter, W8CI, has announced the 2022 Dayton Hamvention Award winners. They are as follows. The Special Achievement Award. Carrie Banke, N6IZW of La Mesa, California, was the winner of the 2022 Dayton Hamvention Special Achievement Award. Banke, first licensed in 1961 and now retired, spent most of his career in the research and development of electronic systems as a microwave RF electrical engineer. This included 14 years as a Qualcomm engineer, developing innovative microwave wireless technologies. 
Spanky's electronic interests span DC to light, with particular interest and expertise in microwaves. His ham radio operations have included transmissions on 136 kilohertz up to laser. Banky's support to human spaceflight amateur radio started in 1994 when he served as a school technical mentor and certified ground station for the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment Program. When NASA transitioned from SARX to the International Space Station, Banky became a member of the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station hardware team. For seven years, working from his home and electronics lab garage, Banky led the circuit design, breadboarding, flight circuit board layout, assembly, and testing of the Aris developed multi voltage power supply. This compact power supply innovation serves as the backbone of the Aris next generation on orbit radio system. Banky's contributions to the recently launched Aris hardware system has significantly enhanced current ham operations on the ISS. Additionally, they enable future amateur radio expansion and experimentation that will permit new educational and operational capabilities for youths and hams. Annually, hundreds of thousands of ISS ham contacts are made via the voice repeater and APRS digipeter, and thousands of youth are inspired and engaged through ARIS ham radio connections with astronauts aboard the ISS. The Technical Achievement Award Adam Farson, VA7OJ slash AB4OJ of West Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, was the winner of the 2022 Dayton Hamvention Technical Achievement Award for his dedicated professional work with RF and telecommunications engineering issues and innovation. He has been a ham since he was a teenager. Best known to the amateur radio community for his development of multiple sources of technical support for ICOM radios, Farson started an ICOM technical support net on 20 meters in the 1980s. He came to know several senior ICOM Japan engineers while living in and traveling around Japan while working. With each week's net, Farson helped Ham solve challenging technical and logistical issues. Farson has spent three decades creating an online resource for HF radios. His website, a repository for highly technical information on ICOM and other HF transceivers and amplifiers, is now one of the most widely cited internet resources. He independently performs measurements on nearly all new radios, including noise power ratio, a measure he developed. His work includes producing the only data radio hobbyists have, which clearly delineates how modern software-defined radios perform across the spectrum of band noise levels. Farson has written multiple articles for technical and amateur radio journals. Recently, he penned a multi-part series on modern HF solid-state amplifier design principles. Now, with a look at this year's Amateur of the Year Award and the Club of the Year Award, we go to our own Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Jim Simpson, KF8J, is the 2022 Dayton Hamvention Award winner of the Amateur of the Year Award. First licensed as a teen, Simpson built his first tower in 1966. He worked 39 states, including Hawaii, while living at home with his family. His first shack was in the corner of his dad's garage. Simpson built all of his equipment from Heathkit. He upgraded to a general class license in the late 1970s. He built two towers at his current location in Zinnia in 1980, a 100-foot guide tower for HF antennas, and a 55-foot freestanding tower for satellite communications. Simpson operates on 80 through 10 meters, mostly using voice with some digital operations, as well as on 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Simpson attended his first Dayton Hamvention in 1972. He was a member of the Hamvention Committee for several years and was the first to use computers for the annual event to streamline recording data. In 1974, a tornado devastated the city of Zinnia, Ohio. In 1975, Simpson saw a way to serve the community, and as a young man, he founded the Zinnia Weather Radio Network. He remains active in the organization. Simpson was appointed second assistant to the Hamvention General Chair in 1983. In 1984 and 1985, he was appointed assistant general chair. He was appointed to the Hamvention Chairman on the Dayton Amateur Radio Association Board for the 1986 and 1987 Hamvention events. Simpson has served on the Hamvention Committee continuously since 1973. During that period, he introduced several technical innovations to the event and remains a senior advisor on the committee. Over many years, he mentored many local hams and has been active in many amateur radio projects in and around Zinnia. The Club of the Year Award goes to the Highland Amateur Radio Association, or HERA, K8HO, an ARRL special service club located in Hillsboro, Ohio, has been named the 2022 Club of the Year. Hera 
was established in 1977 and serves a small rural population in Highland County, Ohio. As a result of ongoing licensing classes and mentoring sessions, the club reached an all-time high membership in 2021 with 143 members. Since 2015, membership has grown by 86% and the membership is comprised of hams from 10 surrounding counties in southwest Ohio and two states. The club maintains five repeaters within Highland County, of which two are linked to provide a broader footprint. The club hosts a weekly 2-meter and 10-meter net with an average attendance of 28. There are monthly programs as well as a monthly gathering called the Breakfast Bunch. The club has an excellent relationship with the local newspaper and leverages that relationship to make the community aware of its events and of the value and importance of amateur radio. The Dayton Hamvention 2022 is set for May 20th through the 22nd at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Zinnia, Ohio. Zinnia is about 16 miles east of Dayton, Ohio. If you'd like more information, you can go to the Hamvention website at www.hamvention.org. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, is among the major exhibitors that participate in Hamvention each year. When submitting contest logs, many contest sponsors will provide an email confirmation of your entry. It's always advisable to check your confirmation email or the contest's logs receive page to ensure that your entry has been submitted and that your entry category, club name, and location are correct. ARRL, CQ, and other contest sponsors allow you to resubmit your log with any corrections before the log submission deadline. The most recent uploaded log will be used for scoring purposes. After the deadline, some contest sponsors will release raw scores that reflect the results before any log checking has been completed. If, after the deadline, you notice an error in your log submission, contact the contest sponsor to correct it before the results are tabulated and made public. Meanwhile, in a March 17th news release, CQ Communications announced, it will not accept competitive entries in any of its sponsored contests by amateur radio stations in Russia, Belarus, or the separatist Donbass region of Ukraine, which uses the unofficial Delta-1 prefix. With more details on this story, we go across the pond to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report through the Southgate News Service. Logs submitted by these stations will be accepted only as check logs. In addition, contacts with these stations by other participants will have zero point value and will not count as multipliers. This is in line with similar action taken by the Radio Society of Great Britain, following the lead of other international sports federations around the world. CQ publisher Richard Ross, Kilo 2 Mike Golf Alpha, said that they regretted the need to take this action and recognised that the vast majority of fellow amateurs who are affected by it are innocent bystanders who had no role in their government's decision to invade another sovereign country. However, in light of the great suffering being inflicted without cause on the people of Ukraine by Russians' leaders, CQ cannot in good conscience stand by and do nothing. The CQ policy will take effect with the 2022 CQ WPX Single Sideband Contest on March the 26th and 27th. Future events will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the situation at the time. On March the 4th, in a statement, the Radio Society of Great Britain said that the normal stance of amateur radio is that it is apolitical. However, it is clear that recent actions by the Russian Federation and their military have crossed a line and the RSGB cannot in this instance remain neutral. The policy of the RSGB is that they will follow the actions of the mainstream sporting bodies with regard to all activities of a competitive nature, such as contests and amateur radio direction-finding events. Russian and Belarusian radio amateurs are therefore currently ineligible to participate in any event that is organised or sponsored by the RSGB. The policy of the RSGB in commercial activities is that they will refrain from trade with Russia and Belarus until further notice. The RSGB board said that for RSGB contests, until further notice, all logs received from stations in the Russian Federation or Belarus will be treated as check logs. 
Belgium's communications regulator, BIPT, said the 50.200 MHz and 51.075 MHz will be used from May 30th to June 18 during a military exercise. With more details, we go to the UK, where Steve Richards, Jeep 4 HPE, has more. Belgium's communications regulator, the BIPT, has informed the country's radio hams that two frequencies in the amateur 6-metre band, 50.200 MHz and 51.075 MHz, will be used from May the 30th to June the 18th during a military exercise. Belgium's National Amateur Radio Society, the UBA, said that the military exercise will be held in Elsenborn, during which the two frequencies within the 6-metre band will be used. The amateur radio service has secondary status in this band. The military services are the primary user. Radio amateurs in Belgium and nearby countries are called upon to pay particular attention during this period, to avoid the use of these frequencies if possible, and certainly to listen carefully to whether the frequency is in use if they still wish to use the frequencies concerned. You can find out more at the UBA website, tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Belgium. Radio amateurs are called upon to pay particular attention to this during the period and to avoid the use of these frequencies if possible and certainly to listen carefully to whether the frequency is in use if they still wish to use the frequencies concerned. The Monthly Volunteer Monitor Program Report The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the Federal Communications Commission to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the February 2022 Activity Report of the Volunteer Monitor Program. Technician class operators in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and Broken Arrow, Oklahoma were issued advisory notices for FT8 operation on 20 meters. Technician licensees have no privileges on 20 meters. Technician class operators in Auburn, Indiana, Crosby, Texas, Pierre, South Dakota, Chicago, Illinois, and Mojave, California were issued advisory notices for FT8 operation on 7.074 MHz. Technicians have only CW privileges on 40 meters. General class operators in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Phoenix, Arizona, and Hefzibah, Georgia were issued advisory notices for operation on 20-meter frequencies not authorized to general class operators. The Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator had two meetings with the FCC and participated in two amateur radio club meetings via video conference. The final totals for Volunteer Monitor Program monitoring during January 2022 were 2,172 hours on HF frequencies and 2,932 hours on VHF frequencies and above for a total of 5,104 hours. We thank Volunteer Monitor Administrator Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this month's report. Perhaps not entirely surprisingly, February's IARU Monitoring System Region 1 newsletter reports increased interference in the amateur radio bands from Russia's over-the-horizon radar called Container. February started as just another regular month, the report says, with its usual painful batch of intrusions, with nothing special to note nevertheless. However, this trend was altered during the last week of the month, when the monitoring team noticed an increase in radar transmissions intruding within our HF amateur radio bands, in particular those of the Russian over-the-horizon radar container, which was observed on several occasions making up to three simultaneous transmissions in the 40-metre amateur band and also transmitting in the 20-meter and 15-meter bands. The British over-the-horizon radar, located at the RAF base in Cyprus, was also quite active, especially in the 15-meter amateur band, and it was also observed on 10 meters. As we move into the rising phase of the new solar cycle, with the improvement of propagation in the higher HF bands, in Europe and Africa, the team is receiving more and more frequent reports of the Iranian over-the-horizon radar transmitting in the 10-meter band. In addition to receiving it daily on 28860 kHz, it was also observed jumping along the whole 10 meter band, and at the end of the month, transmitting daily on 28150 kHz using the same bandwidth. 
Although these radars account for most of the intrusions received each month, the monitoring team state that we should not downplay the importance of other intrusions that take place in our bands, such as daily transmissions from broadcast stations, in particular those caused by the Ethiopia radio station on 7110 kHz AM, or the very frequent reception of the Eritrean Voice of the Broad Masses station on 7140.02 kHz. The full report can be read on the IARU Region 1 website. A U.S. astronaut will now be returning to Earth from the International Space Station after fears his Russian lift home might not materialize. Despite terrestrial tensions dividing the nations, U.S. astronaut Mark Vandehei, KG-5 GNP, is preparing to return to Earth from the International Space Station this month with two cosmonauts on board a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The scheduled landing in Kazakhstan on March 30th is being planned in cooperation with the Russian space agency Roscosmos. According to several news reports, the three crew members' return comes amid fiercely growing tensions between the two countries, tensions that have reportedly spilled over into the space program, particularly with the head of Russia's space agency, Dmitry Rogozin, being a longtime supporter of Russian President Vladimir Putin. However, despite the fact that SpaceX vehicles are now being used for travel to and from the ISS, NASA confirmed on Monday, March 14th, that plans continue to go forward for the three men to return to the Earth together. We are in communication with our Russian colleagues. There's no fuzz on that. Joel Montalbano, NASA's International Space Station Program Manager, said he admitted the astronauts were aware of what's going on in the world, but they still work as a team. Under international space law, astronauts from all nations must provide all possible help to other astronauts when needed, including emergency landing in a foreign country or at sea. All ISS activities have continued for 20 years, and nothing has changed in the last three weeks. Our control centers operate successfully, flawlessly, seamlessly, he said. The United States controls power and life support aboard the station, and Russia controls things such as its propulsion. Earlier this month on Russian state television, Mr. Rogozin announced Roscosmos would halt rocket sales to the U.S. in response to sanctions against Russia. Mr. Vandehei, 55, now holds a new United States record for the most time spent in space. With the recent relaxation of COVID-19 regulations, the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club and Messi Friedrichshafen, partners of the Ham Radio 2022 exhibition in Germany, are optimistically looking forward to holding their 45th Ham Radio from June 24th through the 26th in Friedrichshafen, Germany, subject to the final approval by the local authorities. Appropriate hygienic and distancing measures will be in place for the safety of all visitors. These will have implications on the design of the stands, the opening ceremony, the presentation rooms, and the flea market area. One of the largest amateur radio conventions in the world, alongside the Dayton Hamvention in the U.S. and the Japan Amateur Radio League Ham Fair, Ham Radio attracts exhibitors and visitors from more than 52 countries to Germany. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, will be among the participating International Amateur Radio Union member societies exhibiting at the convention. Ham Radio organizers say they are looking forward to seeing you in Friedrichshafen this June. Citing caution over the continued pandemic, organizers have canceled the annual ham camp that was scheduled to be held in Germany for young amateurs this summer. The young amateurs who had hoped to attend ham camp during Ham Radio Friedrichshafen this coming June will have to wait another year. Although Ham Radio Friedrichshafen, Europe's largest ham radio event, is still taking place on June 24th through the 26th, Organizers have said the logistics of housing more than 100 youngsters and supervisors in close quarters during the same weekend would prove risky under current COVID-19 conditions. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Working Group wrote on the IARU website that the organizers said their decision was not taken lightly and is based on the need to protect participants of minor age and under supervision. The camp is expected to be held next year in 2023. The Radio Society of Great Britain has announced that its legacy committee has agreed to fund a 50 MHz beacon specifically aimed at studying meteor events above the United Kingdom. The RSGB website reports, unlike conventional propagation beacons, this will beam vertically up using circular polarization. 
The 50 megahertz band is particularly suitable for observing meteors by radio as they create an ionized trail strongly reflective to radio at that frequency while they burn up on entry to the Earth's atmosphere. This is a collaborative project between the amateur radio and radio astronomy communities and will enable a range of radio-based citizen science and STEM projects studying meteors. The beacon is to be located at the Sherwood Observatory of the Mansfield and Sutton Astronomical Society, a central location for coverage in the UK. According to recent publications, the Voice of America news programming and more are now beaming from the United States to overseas listeners via shortwave, most particularly Russia and Ukraine, through a citizens-based effort known as Shortwaves for Freedom. The U.S. Agency for Global Media, the Umbrella Center, under which the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and Radio Liberty operate, are not directly involved in any of these transmissions. Instead, Shortwaves for Freedom is making use of the fact that Voice of America programming is public domain and easily downloadable from the VOA website for transmission over the air. According to a report on Washington, D.C.-based political news website The Hill, Miami Radio International, WRMI in Florida, has already agreed to transmit the broadcast. The Hill's story is that Shortwaves for Freedom is receiving technical assistance from Gerhard Straub, who's retired as Director of Broadcast Technologies at the VOA's parent agency. The general manager of Miami Radio International told The Hill that his radio station is already transmitting the VOA program Flashpoint Ukraine, which is in English. The same news report said there's plans to add programming in Ukrainian and expand the broadcast. Voice of America is originally part of the United States Department. In 1947, the Voice of America commenced shortwave transmissions of Russian language programming into what was then the Soviet Union. The Arecibo Observatory, the former home of the iconic radio telescope, is ready to open its doors to visitors once again. The powerful radio telescope at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico is long gone following a collapse in 2020, but its visitor center and observation deck are back in business. Guests making reservations in advance are able to see what's left of the reflective dish that helped researchers win a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1993. Ricardo Correra, Director of Communications, told United Press International Arecibo is not closed anymore. He said that scientific research still continues at the United States National Science Foundation facility using such tools as a 12-meter telescope and a LIDAR scanning to study the atmosphere by bouncing laser beams off particles above our planet. There is also a tribute to the iconic radio telescope itself. An outdoor exhibit features artifacts recovered from the telescope and its platform. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Happy Daylight Saving Time. Uh -huh. I'm not a fan. Are you a fan? No, I like Daylight Saving Time. I don't like going the other direction. But I have to say, once you've gone the other direction, going back to Daylight Savings Time, no fun. Because now we lose an hour last night, right? On the worst night, you could lose an hour. Saturday night. That's the night. At my age, I go to bed at 9. Doesn't really matter. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you made it. You're on time. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, starting a little early because the clock sprang forward. And then nowadays, in most cases, of their own accord, which is kind of cool. John, you probably had to come in here and change a clock or two, though, I bet. There's five clocks in my office alone that are manual, that are not attached to the Internet somehow. But your phone changes and your computer changes. Yeah. And we have a smart clock that ain't so smart because it has the wrong dates. Because it was made before the dates changed in, uh, what is it, 2008 or something. <sighs> in my house, it's the oven and the microwave. They're too, they're too stupid. <laughs> but everything else... <laughs> Ian, and I try to buy those clocks that, uh, you know, get their time from the radio waves, WWT, uh, or V, WWV, and uh, most of the time that works pretty well. Most of the time that works pretty well, so that's cool. Anyway, happy daylight saving time. Also, happy Apple event, new Apple stuff. Actually, processors are really the story of Tuesday, last Tuesday. Apple is just, just like, poof. They're just 
They're just leaving everybody in the dust because they're designing their own and they can design them to work with their hardware and most importantly with their operating system to work better. They said, we have a secret feature you didn't know about. Ha ha. You thought you knew everything with the leaks. We've got a secret feature in our processors that allows us to connect them together like Lego pieces and, and talk to each other at a super high speed. Now, by the way, Intel does this, AMD does this, everybody does this. When you get a quad core, you have four processors connected together. But the interconnect, the way the processors talk to each other on the new Apple stuff is reputedly, because you know, no, nobody's tested it yet, but reputedly, according to Apple, really, really fast. Really, really fast. So that's good. That means Apple can, you know, snap these things together and make... So this time they've got two die, each with its own unified memory and a fast interconnect to the other die so they can act as one. And uh, boy, the speeds they're getting. So this was the Ultra. They have a Mac M1. That's in the iPad Air and the original M1 computers. The M1 Pro, which came out last year. No, this... Yeah, last October. M1 Pro... M1 Max, which you'd think, I mean, maximum means the maximum, but no, there's one more step, at least, the M1 Ultra is the new one. And while we saw, we thought maybe they'd announce a new Mac Mini, they didn't. It was only the day before that people said, wait a minute, it's not a Mac Mini, it's a Mac Studio. And it doesn't look like the all of the rumors that all oh, have a plexiglass top, blah, blah, blah. none of that. Now, you might ask, well, were they making that up? Probably not. Apple probably did have a prototype that had a plexiglass top. You know what happened? I know what happened. They put these chips in, and they went, whoa, that's hot. Because <laughs> the, the Mac Mini is small. It's a really compact enclosure. Whoa, that's hot. How are we going to solve this? Oh, man. I know. <laughs> we'll make it a little taller, not quite twice as tall, and put, f you know, they're not fans. They're turbines in there that take the air from, you know, the hot air from the chip, make it an L turn and blow it out the back. And they're going to do it quietly because they're big old turbines and, you know, the bigger, the more air they move, the lower RPM, blah, blah, blah. Interesting, we're learning now that the Ultra, Mac Mini Ultra, I'm sorry, the Mac Studio Ultra is two pounds heavier than what looks like exactly the same size case of the M1 Max in the Mac Studio. And it is because instead of using aluminum cooling fins and things, they're using copper, which is much more expensive these days uh, and heavier. So that kind of tells you something. Why would they use copper? Because it's hot. They need all the cooling they can get. So that makes sense. So probably Apple did in the rumor mill, you know, probably noticed it. Somebody in China said, here's a picture. Look, we're making them make prototypes with the plexiglass top and the same thin thing. And then they realized, oh, this is too hot. So uh, they changed it, forgot to tell the rumor mongers. It does leak out, you know, like the day before it leaked out because uh, when you're recording these events, which Apple does still, they don't have a, you know, studio audience coming into Cupertino or anything like that. They do all recorded ahead of time. So they, to bring in contractors and eh, these guys, you know, you can't, can't completely control them. So it leaked out. But yeah, if you were paying attention to the rumors, you might have missed the excitement anyway. Now, it's a new monitor, too. There was a rumor. Again, the rumors got it wrong. Oh, 7K, they said. It'll be a 7K monitor. I don't know why anybody would want a 7K. It'll be a 7K monitor. And it wasn't. It was It was just your standard 4K monitor. But it was designed to work with the Mac Studio. And that's really the bottom line, I think, and we're starting to see this now, is that's the new iMac. They're not going to make an all-in-one high-end iMac. They still have the 24-inch for people who want beauty, it's in color, it's super thin, it's gorgeous. If that's what you want in your living room, you get the 24-inch iMac. But if you want a power tool, there is no new iMac Pro or high-end or big-screen iMac. This is it. But when you pair the Mac Studio, it's even got a little tray on the new monitor, on top of the Mac Studio monitor, they go together perfectly. But here's the, the only really interesting thing in all this. Well, I mean, it's interesting because Apple is just making super fast stuff that nobody seems to be able to keep up with. That's of interest as well. But the other thing that's kind of interesting uh, in all of this is that for some reason they've put a iPhone chip in the Mac monitor, the Mac Studio monitor, as fast as an iPhone 11. It's a A13 Bionic. Why? Why does this monitor need an iPhone inside? I think maybe is it going to be a TV? Is it going to be 
I mean, it does, hey, <clears throat> Shlomo, hey, you know who. But you don't need a A11, A13 for that, iPhone 11 chip for that. It uh, it does the, the center stage thing where the camera zooms in on you and moves around. You don't need a... You don't need that fast of a processor for that. There's something else they want to do with this monitor. Why else would you put, unless you had a warehouse full of <clears throat> A13 chips that <laughs> you couldn't sell. Maybe that's why. I don't know. I think there's something there. Another secret, but we'll find out. Also, you don't need it because they even said for, for use with Siri, you need a computer. So it isn't doing the Siri work. It's just doing the listening. There's more to meets the eye in that one. Well, there's another shoe to drop. Unless Apple just said, yeah, we got all these A13s. Just put them in the monitor. Let's talk tech, you and me. We are having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. A great conversation about cyber warfare. And unfortunately, got a little bit cut off. So let me kind of update. The real fear from Russia, China, North Korea. They all have their hackers, their hacking group. The big ha hacking group in Russia is called Fancy Bear by some, which is a very fanciful name for something that is not quite so uh, fanciful. They are, of course, they're associated with, probably run by the Russian military intelligence, GRU. Uh, and they have been in the past very active. You know, I think if you talk to intelligence uh, agencies, they'll say, you know, a lot of the ransomware we've been experiencing is probably at least countenanced, if not funded and supported by the Russian government. 75% of all the ransomware activity comes out of Russia, the Russian ransomware groups. And at the very least, Putin's turning a blind eye towards them. More likely, he's supporting them because what do they attack? They attack the West. It's very destabilizing. So cyber warfare is a real concern, but there's some cause, I think, for optimism. One... It hasn't happened. I think there was a real fear that once Russia invaded Ukraine, they'd let loose the hounds of hacking and we'd see cyber warfare everywhere. In fact, right before the invasion, he shut down the banking system in the Ukraine. A couple of years ago, the electric grid was brought down for a few hours. In both cases, Russian hackers. And the thinking was Russia uses Ukraine as a test bed for its cyber warfare capabilities. But here they are in a hot war in an invasion, and they haven't used them. And so there's a couple of thoughts, possibilities, I guess. One is that Ukraine, having been warned, hardened its defenses and is, in fact, much less vulnerable than they used to be. That would be really good news if that's possible. That would be very good news. We know, though, with all the zero days, all the nation-state attacks, we know that all these countries are, including us, by the way, we're doing it too, are looking very hard at ways to wage a cyber war. In fact, the news uh, report said that President Biden had been presented with options for cyber war, but elected not to use them. I, the White House denies that, but I think it's likely. So maybe Ukraine was able to harden itself. Maybe we've been able to. In 2018, we founded something called CISA. And this has been, I think, a real uh, improvement in our, in our posture, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They've spent a lot of money hardening our weak points, like our grid, electrical grid. And I presume the NSA and others are working on uh, offensive technologies. And it may also be that Russia, that Putin is, is reasonably concerned that if he were to launch a cyber war, we would retaliate and it would be as it was in the nuclear era, mutually assured destruction, and he doesn't want to bring that down. So it's it may, maybe it's a combination uh, of kind of trepidation on Putin's part and a better security posture on our part, on the part of the West. It's certainly the case that ransomware has not abated. Cyber scams have not abated. Uh, you, if you look at your email, your spam filters, you probably see uh, every day, I know I do, emails trying to take it, you know, trying to, Hack me in one way or the other. Con me in one way or the other. And any company is getting those regularly for phishing attacks. Mostly, I think, that's for financial gain. But, you know, there's a blurred line between fancy bears, nation state attacks for geopolitical results and, you know, the various malware groups in Russia trying to do it for money. There's a mutual, uh, they're well aligned. <laughs> there's a mutual benefit. So should we worry about cyber warfare? Yeah, we should certainly be prudent. And if you run infrastructure, if you run the banking system, if you run the food system, you should make darn sure that you're hardened. You know, the Colonial Pipeline attack, remember this? Last year, 
brought down an oil pipeline and caused gas panics in uh, the southeast. You remember people lining up and filling up gas cans and various <laughs> other things with gasoline because of the pipeline attack. That was uh, last summer. That was a call to action because that's infrastructure, right? It's probable, we don't know, but it's probable that that hack came from a nation state, probably Russia. And uh, it was ransomware, right? They wanted money. Whether it was the Russian government or just Russian-located hackers, again, that line is blurred. But I think it was also, uh, in two ways, it was a call to action. In one, it was a call from CISA and others to say, look, infrastructure attacks are off limits. You do that, you're in trouble. And then also to harden those systems. This hack was ridiculous. They got into Colonial Pipeline because they got a password from a leak, you know, a, a breach. A Colonial employee used the same password on various accounts. And uh, then the hackers got it and they tried and, yeah, oh, look, we're in. <laughs> we're in. It was a uh, Russian cybercrime group called Dark Side, probably for money, $4.4 million ransom. And it's thought that maybe Putin said, knock it off to these guys because they kind of disappeared. Knock it off because I don't want to bring, you know, down the ire of the West on my, our head. We're vulnerable. It certainly woke us up. It was a wake up call for the U.S. And perhaps it was uh, maybe something to keep the Russians uh, under control. I don't know. They don't seem like they're in much control, do they? So should we worry about it? Yeah. Should we be prudent? Yeah. Should we work hard to harden our defenses? Absolutely. But there seems to be some positive news that it hasn't happened. And so it's reasonable to say, why? Why hasn't it happened? At least in Ukraine, apparently uh, lost its ability to, to disrupt the power grid because they had to start attacking nuclear plants, trying to bring the power grid down that way. Hmm. That's interesting. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with this week's propagation forecast report, we go back to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who reports from League Headquarters. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports, We saw plenty of sunspot activity this week, along with numerous solar flares. A confounding indicator was a higher average solar flux, but lower average sunspot numbers. We expect to see these parameters track together, but that's not always the case, Tad says. Average daily sunspot number went from 87.4 last week to 74.6 in the March 10th through 16th reporting week. Average daily solar flux increased from 115.5 to 119. Here's more details from the space weather woman, Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. Meanwhile, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you guys are in good luck because uh, we're continuing to stay in the triple digits when it comes to solar flux. This means radio propagation on Earth's day side is in the good range. Now, we are getting some uh, radio blackouts, just little teeny tiny ones. They're not really all that intense, but uh, so that might cause a bit of noise on the bands. And you GPS users, well, you're the ones who are really kind of dealing with that right now, especially if you're near dawn or near dusk. You're, you're GPS reception may be a little bit unreliable. As predicted, a coronal mass ejection from the Sun hit Earth's magnetic field on Sunday, March the 13th. Spaceweather.com reported that the impact sparked a moderately strong G2 class geomagnetic storm, which lasted for more than 12 hours. Alan Tuff of Moray in Scotland said it was the best display he'd seen in years, and Laura Cranish from Germany said it was the brightest aurora she'd witnessed in seven years. In addition to auroras, the CME also jolted Earth's magnetic field and caused electricity to flow through the soil of northern Norway. Citizen scientist Rob Stammes measured these effects from his space weather observatory in the Lofoten Islands. The whole episode is a sign of strength from young Solar Cycle 25 and a hint of things to come. If forecasters are correct, Solar Maximum will arrive in two to three years, bringing even stronger storms. If you haven't seen auroras yet, you might soon. 
and you can sign up to Aurora Alerts via SMS text. Just go to spaceweather.com for this and a lot more Daily Sun reports. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XLY. It was a dark and stormy night. The young novice sat alone in the big, gothic, Victorian-style house. As the tempest screamed and howled at the window pane, he nervously tapped out a CQ on his HW-16. Behind him, the house creaked and groaned ominously. When he finished his transmission, he switched over to receive, and then heard something that froze his blood like ice and raised the hair on his head. His mouth opened in a wordless scream. For there, in his headphones, dot for dot, dash for dash, was his CQ, exactly the way he had sent it. That night, our young amateur became a member of one of the rarest clubs in amateur radio history. Those who have heard long-delayed echoes, like flying saucers, long-delayed echoes are a matter of debate. Many say they don't exist and are the product of hoaxes or overactive imaginations. Others, including a professor of mathematics, a physicist, and a communication satellite manager at an aerospace corporation, have heard them and even made tape recordings. Let's take a look at the history of long-delayed echoes, or LDEs for short. LDEs were first noticed in 1927, just a couple of years after the development of the shortwaves. Two stations, both non-amateurs, were in contact on 9600 kilocycles when they noticed their own signals faintly reflected back to them after a three-second delay. Further tests revealed variations in echoes at intervals between 1 and 30 seconds. Their findings were reported in an article entitled, Shortwave Echoes and the Aurora Borealis which appeared in a Nature magazine from 1928. The first QST article on LDEs appeared in August 1934. However, follow-up reports were sporadic and infrequent. Then, in 1948, the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University undertook a year-long study of long-delayed echoes. They transmitted 27,000 tests on 13.4 and 20.6 megacycle. The result? Not one LDE was recorded. For many in the scientific world, the issue was now settled. Like flying saucers, however, LDEs refused to die. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, dozens of amateurs heard them. The lowest frequency reported was 850 kilocycles, home of the broadcast station KOA in Denver. The highest was on the 2-meter band. LDEs appeared on all popular modes in use. AM, CW, and sideband. Most reports were from the shortwave bands between 3.5 and 28 megacycles. The shortest delay was one quarter of a second. The longest and amazing 300 seconds was noted twice, in 1958 and 1968. Most delays seemed to fall into three groups, one half second, three seconds, and eight seconds. The duration of those echoes also varied widely, from less than one half second to more than 20 seconds. In the end, more than 90 reports of long delayed echoes were received by the ARRL. LDEs could no longer be ignored and in 1969, QST started a two-year study of the echoes. Many possible solutions were proposed. One, the echoes were a hoax. Although one bona fide hoax was uncovered, the sheer number of reports over several decades from all points of the globe made this an unlikely choice. Two, the echoes were a product of overactive imaginations. This might be the answer when the delay was one half second or when the echo consisted of one or two CW characters. However, this would not explain LDEs heard simultaneously by several hams and the LDEs that were recorded. Three, the echoes involved multiple passes of the radio signal around the earth. Since radio waves travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, a complete RF orbit takes one-seventh of a second. It is possible that the one-half to one-second delays were caused by the RF signal getting trapped in the ionosphere for six or seven orbits before returning to Earth. 4. 
The echoes are a result of moon bounce. This may explain the LDEs with a 2.5 to 3 second delay. One theory suggested that ionospheric conditions focus the signals to the moon. 5. The echoes were the result of a cosmic repeater. Yes, this really was proposed. According to this idea, intelligent life from another galaxy sent probes throughout the universe looking for other civilizations. As these probes approached the Earth, they detected RF transmissions and beamed them back to our planet as a sign that we are not alone. Before you laugh too hard, remember that this theory was proposed in the late 1960s, hot on the heels of the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. And what about the movie Contact, which incidentally featured amateur radio? 6. The echoes are the result of ionized gases and particles from the sun floating in space. This theory could explain the 8 second delays. A variation on this theory was the reflection from the planet Jupiter, which generates its own strong RF signals easily copied on Earth around 20 to 30 megacycles. So, what was the answer? Well, there never was a definitive conclusion. After the early 1970s, reports of an interest in long-delayed echoes diminished. Today, they are just a question mark in amateur radio history. After all, I've never heard LDEs. Have you? In our next installment, we will have our feet firmly planted on the ground, or at least on the disco dance floor, as we look at amateur radio in the late 1970s. I hope to see you then. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike from the Parks on the Air News Desk with your month ending February 2022 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. And now we'll get started with Parks on the Air News. Parks on the Air is excited to welcome a new batch of DX entities to the program this month. Be on the lookout for new parks getting added in Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Kingdom of Eswatini, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, Suriname, Guyana, Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Falkland Islands. If your country or one you'd like to represent is not yet part of POTA, please reach out via the Contact Us link from parksontheair.com and we'll help you get started as a volunteer country administrator. In upcoming events, we hope you join us for the upcoming Spring Support Your Parks event on April 16th and 17th UTC. We also hope you'll join us this summer for our very popular annual plaque event on July 16th and 17th UTC. There will be three new plaques available for DX activators this year, one each for stations activating outside of the continental U.S. in IARU Regions 1, 2, and 3. Sponsorship opportunities will be opening at the end of March, so if you or your club is interested in sponsoring a plaque, please send an email to n3vem at parksontheair.com. Due to steady growth and improving conditions that make a possible too, as KN4MQR said on Twitter, load up a wet pasta noodle and get pile-ups for hours, we are expecting a very large turnout for this summer's event. And now for the monthly stats update. February had a lot of activity for being the shortest month of the year. With an average of 270 activations happening every day, there ended up being just under 1,500 operators who did approximately 7,500 activations. They did this from over 3,000 different parks in 31 different DX entities. Top activators for the month were N2NWK, who did 217 activations, and K4NYM, who activated 78 different parks. The top hunter for the month was KO4GAR, who hunted 1,044 parks while making 1,796 QSOs as a hunter. In our POTA DX corner, the busiest countries have held their spots, with England as our Region 1 leader at 87 activations, Canada as our Region 2 leader with approximately 285 activations, and Japan as our Region 3 and overall DX leader with 362 activations. The top DX activator for the month was JI1ORE with 40 activations from 39 different parks. This is the second month in a row where our overall DX leader was from Region 1. Congratulations! And last but not least, let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. 
In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every day. So in 2022, we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 59 days into the year, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year. N2NWK, KE8PZN, K4NYM, KD4MZM, and KB3WAV. The pool of hunters still in the running has shrunk considerably, down from 91 last month to just 53. To all of the Bailey Sprott participants, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do throughout the year. This concludes our February 2022 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of my favorite activities is contesting. Essentially, it's a time-limited activation of your station for the purposes of testing your skill and station against other participants. Contests are controlled by rules as varied as the amateur community itself. That said, there are common terms and concepts, and if you're not familiar with them, they can lead to confusion and disappointment when you inadvertently break a rule and see your hard work vanish into thin air. I will note that what I'm discussing here is not universally true, so read the rules for each contest you participate in, something you should already be doing since rules are refined over time, and it's rare to keep the same rules between years. A contest starts and stops at a specific time, often expressed in UTC or Universal Coordinated Time. You should know what your local time zone is in relation to UTC and take into account any variations like summer and winter time. Any contacts made outside these times don't count and you cannot log these against the contest. Each contact or QSO is awarded a set number of points. It might be scored based on mode, band, power, time, and sometimes distance. To encourage specific types of contacts, some might attract a score of zero. This does not mean that the contact is useless, which I'll get to shortly. Your score is the sum of all the points you make for each contact. I will mention that contest logging software can track this to make your life easier, although it comes at the price of requiring a computer. Sometimes a prohibited contact attracts penalties prohibited as in by the rules of that contest. For example, some allow you to contact the same station more than once. Others allow this only if you do it on a different band. Speaking of bands, it's not permitted to make contest contacts on the WAC bands. In 1979, the World Administrative Radio Conference allocated the 30 meter, 17 meter and 12 meter bands for amateur use. These are not used for contesting. To avoid a contest, you can use those bands, but truth be told, you should try to use all the bands, even during contests, since it will help you operate your station in adverse conditions, something worth practicing. Many contests allocate additional scoring based on state, country, DXCC entity, CQ or ITU zone, prefix or all of these together. Both the CQ and ITU zones represent regions of the world. The CQ zones are managed by CQ Magazine, and the ITU zones are managed by the International Telecommunications Union. A zone is represented by a number. The DXCC is a system that tracks individual countries across the globe. If you make contact with 100 of these places, you've achieved your DX Century and you join the DX Century Club, or DXCC. Consider a contact with me. You'd have a contact with Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. It would also be a contact with the Victor Kilo 6 prefix. The Victor Kilo DXCC entity, CQ Zone 29 and ITU Zone 58. If that's not enough, it would also be a contact with Oscar Charlie 001, the IOTA or Islands on the Air designation for Australia. This is useful because for some contests, these extra features represent points, often significant ones, generally referred to as a multiplier. To calculate your score, tally up all your contact points, then count all the features, CQ zones, the ITU zones, DXCC entities, states, countries, etc., and multiply your score with that count. If you contact 10 call signs and get one point for each, you have 10 points. If in doing so you contact five contest features, you end up with an overall score of 50 points. Often, contests have different categories and rules for transmitter power level, the number of transmitters, and the number of operators. 
Definitions for these vary. High power might be 400 watts in Australia, but 1500 watts in the United States. QRP or very low power might be 10 watts in one contest, but 5 in another, so check. Some contests have an assisted category, where you're permitted to use tools like the DX cluster, where other stations alert you online to their presence on a particular frequency. There is a concept of an overlay, where how long you've held your license, your age, working portable, battery operated, using a wire antenna or mobile, groups you with others doing the same thing. This means that you could be a rookie, youth, portable, battery, wire, antenna, single assisted operator, all at the same time. It often pays to consider who else is in a particular group and make your claims accordingly. If you're contesting with more than one person, a multi-station, there are rules for that too. Sometimes this includes the amount of land a contest station is permitted to use. If you're a multi-single station, you might be permitted to use one transmitted signal on one band during any 10-minute period. A multi-two might be permitted to use two simultaneous transmitted signals, but they must be on two different bands. A multi-multi may activate all six contest bands at the same time, but only use one transmitter per band. Some contests have a shortwave listener or SWL category, where you log all stations heard. There's also the concept of a check log, where you log all your contacts, submit them, but don't enter the contest itself. You might have workstations during the contest, but not according to the rules, because you might be aiming to get your DXCC. Submitting your log will help the contest organizers check other entries and validate the scores of the stations you contacted. This might all be daunting, but if you read the rules of a contest and you're not sure, every contest manager I've ever spoken to is more than happy to help you understand what's allowed and what isn't. One tip, contesting is as much about the rules that are written as it is about the rules that are not. If you find a gap in the rules and it doesn't go against the spirit of the contest, you're absolutely encouraged to use that to your advantage. If you do, you'll quickly discover why the rules change so often. Preparation is everything. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Japan Amateur Radio League President Yoshinori Takao, JG1 KTC, is a member of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications released a report in November of 2021 entitled Radio Policy Council in the Age of Digital Transformation, which noted the amateur radio population is declining and amateur radio growth must continue. Young people will lead the future, the report said, considering creating an environment that makes it easier to get started in amateur radio. The government ministry said it would proceed with studies towards developing a system and environment that would make it easier to utilize amateur radio as the realization of experimental and a research environment. Another goal is to speed up the process of acquiring an amateur radio license and establishing and operating a ham radio station in Japan. The advisory board held its first meeting back on January 26th. Time now for the AMSAT report. AMSAT has announced the availability of a Discord server for the amateur satellite community. Discord is a text, voice, and video client that's become very popular in recent years. Discord will provide the amateur satellite community with an additional option to communicate among members in real time. Discord provides several neat features, including the following, the ability to create channels to organize different conversation topics, the hosting of events that can include voice and or video chat, the use of bots to automate useful functions, and notification of Twitter posts of interest, and more. For more information and to find out how to join the AMSAT Members Only channel, visit www.amsat.org. Scroll down to the ANS Bulletin and click on ANS-072 for March 13th. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. MSF Mike Sierra Foxtrot is the call sign of the long-standing time and frequency standard transmitted on a frequency of 60 kilohertz. The modulation contains time and date information and the frequency is very accurately maintained to two parts in 10 to the 12. Using 17 kilowatts of power, it's transmitted from Anthorn radio station in Cumbria under contract to the National Physical Laboratory and is the signal used by a wide range of radio controlled clocks.
It can be received throughout the UK as well as most of Northern and Western Europe. A scheduled annual maintenance shutdown of the MSF service to allow safe working on the masts and antennas will take place from Monday the 4th of April to Thursday the 21st of April 2022. The service will be off air from 07 to 17 hours UTC every day, including weekends. The transmission will be restored overnight whenever possible. If the weather is unsuitable for work to be carried out, then the service will not be turned off. The signal is occasionally taken off air to allow safe maintenance work on the masts and antennas at Anthorn Radio Station. A radio-controlled clock will not be able to pick up the MSF signal during these periods, so it may drift off the correct time. There are other occasional shutdowns which take place between 09 and 13 hours UTC in June and September, and between 10 and 14 hours UTC in December. The duration of each outage period will be kept to a minimum, and the signal may be back on air prior to the times stated. Information about MSF and dates for outages of this service can be checked at www.npl.co.uk forward slash MSF hyphen signal. And our thanks to Mike Terry for this information. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has retired as ARRL News Editor. The position includes responsibilities like producing news content for the ARRL website, the weekly ARRL letter, and the happenings column in QST, as well as voicing the weekly ARRL audio news. Lindquist began his long association with ARRL in 1995. While on the staff, he served as product review editor and then senior news editor. He retired from ARRL in 2007 and then returned in 2013 to fulfill the news editor duties on a freelance basis while most recently working remotely from home in Maine. I've logged a total of some 26 years as an ARRL staffer at HQ and as a contractor, Lindquist said. As I approach 77, I've determined that sitting in front of a screen was not quite the retirement dream I'd had in mind, and that it was simply time to get out of the chair and spend more time with my girlfriend, my three lovely cats, and all the household chores and community activities, such as choral singing, you could possibly imagine. I do not countenance sitting or standing idly by, Oh, and I may even do some casual CW contesting. I will miss gazing out of my office window to see the eagles, hawks, and seabirds along or on the Union River. Lindquist will continue in his freelance position as managing editor for the National Contest Journal. ARRL staff are continuing to publish the ARRL letter and ARRL news while a new news editor is sought. A position description and other ARRL position and employment opportunities are listed at www.arrl.org slash careers. World Radio Sport Team Championship 2022, a special event station, have been on the air to call attention to the international competition now set to take place July 2023. Stations that have already worked towards the WRTC 2022 award in January and February may be contacted again. Stations need 50 points for the award. The point structure is 5 for CW contacts, 10 for SSB, and 12 for RTTY contacts, and 17 for FT8 or mixed. Points accumulate each month. Your March score will be added to your February and January scores. Register and log in to HTTPS colon, right slash, right slash, hamaward.cloud, and select RTC 2022 award to access your score page and logbook. The WRTC 2022 award organizers are asking participants not to send or email QSL cards. Further information will show up on the Hunter's website. Special call signs are active during this event. More than 100 Italian radio amateurs will activate special WRTC call signs, one for each Italian call district, concluding on July 10th. A first-time award promoting WRTC 2022 will be available. Look for these call signs to be active during some contests, concluding with the 2022 International Amateur Radio Union HF World Championship. 
Each participant contacts totals and award hunter scores will be displayed on a real-time leaderboard. Participants can download the award in digital format. In May 2021, father and son Summits on the Air activators Tom Reed, M1 EYP, and Jimmy Reed, M0 HGY, the Soda Association Manager, completed activating every Soda Summit in Wales, or so they thought. Detailed surveying work later that year, however, revealed the existence of a new Maryland summit in Wales, Renog Fac. Maryland is the nickname given to British and Irish hills with a topographical prominence of 150 meters and is also the qualification criteria for a summit to be included in Summits on the Air in the UK. The new entity was designated the soda reference GW-NW-078. Simon Maluish, G4TJC, was the first to operate from this particular Maryland in October 2021. The Reed set out to activate the summit on December 21st, 2021. The walk was a long one and included a steep final ascent, but the pair were able to complete most of the route in the short daylight hours. Jimmy made 12 contacts, all on 2 meter FM, while Tom completed 19, mainly on 20, 30, and 40 meters on CW. Jimmy and Tom Reed can once again claim to have activated every soda summit in England, Wales, North Ireland, Isle of Man, Jersey, and Guernsey. The Nordic HF Conference takes place every three years, and the next one is planned for August 15th through the 17th, 2022, reports the Norwegian Radio Relay League, Norway's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society. The NRRL says the conference is a meeting place for industry and defense research within HF, as well as for radio amateurs. The conference takes place in a relaxed and informal environment and Faro, an island north of Gotland on the Swedish East Coast. The event will include many exciting lectures, together with radio antennas held outdoor or in an exhibition tent. The Nordic HF Conference website includes useful information about the conference, a link to registration, and a look back at previous conferences. AMSAT has received a generous grant from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications for the development of a 3U space frame with deployable solar panels. This standardized 3U CubeSat space frame will serve as a mechanical platform for AMSAT's greater orbit, larger footprint, or golf series of satellites, as well as the new generation of low Earth orbit, or LEO, FM satellites. Central to the development of the 3U space frame, AMSAT will build three flight-ready space frames for an upcoming series of satellites with potentially enhanced flight control, payload, and communications capability. The need for a 3U space frame with deployable solar panels goes back to the original design requirements for the Golf satellites that would return AMSAT to high elliptical orbit. The benefit of this program will provide satellites with a wider coverage and longer access times to the entire amateur radio satellite community. Amateur radio on the International Space Station has announced that two crew members scheduled to fly on Axiom Mission 1, AX-1, the first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station, will carry out amateur radio contacts with six schools while in space. With more details on this first private mission to the space station, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from Ellsworth, Maine. The AX-1 mission is currently set to launch from Florida on March 30th via a SpaceX Falcon 9 launcher and the crew will spend 10 days in orbit aboard the ISS. AX-1 crew members Mark Pathy, KO4WFH from Canada, and Aiton Stibbe, 4Z9SPC from Israel, will carry out the contacts. ARIS has trained both crew members in the use of the ARIS radio system and the ISS Columbus module. Stibbe will use ARIS facilities on board the ISS to answer questions from students in Israel Israel Pathy will connect with elementary and high schoolers across Canada. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. As part of the Rakia mission, Stibby will use ARIS facilities on board the ISS to answer questions from middle school and high school students in Israel. Forty classes are expected to participate, and in the weeks preceding the launch, the students will learn a bit about the theory and practice of radio communication. 
Pathy, whose personal mission theme is caring for people and the planet, will connect with elementary and high schoolers across Canada from the ISS. Pathy will answer student-developed questions that range from how his body has reacted to being in space to handling everyday tasks in zero gravity, as well as thoughtful questions around the state of our planet. The long-held dream of private missions to stations in space becomes a reality on AX-1, said Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, Executive Director of ARIS USA and Chair of ARIS International. ARIS is proud to collaborate with Axiom Space Mark Pathy and ITAN Stibby on this flight and support the AX-1 crew members through amateur radio contacts that will inspire, engage, and educate school students in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math topics. Mary Lynn Dittmar, Executive Vice President of Government Operations and Strategic Communications for Axiom Space, said, Axiom is proud to help enable the educational work of ARIS USA on this historic mission. For years, ARIS and its programs have inspired students across the globe to pursue interests in science, technology, engineering, and math, and we are pleased that AX1 will join the list of missions that have contributed to this important educational work. The AX1 mission includes an international crew of four, with Axiom's Michael Lopez Alegria, XKE5GTK, a former NASA astronaut and now an Axiom vice president. Lopez Alegria will serve as mission commander. The fourth crew member, Larry Connor, will serve as the pilot. The goal for the AX-1 crew is to set a standard for all future private astronaut missions in terms of our preparation and professionalism, Lopez Alegria said in a NASA news release. Down the road, Axiom will build modules that will attach to the ISS. Axiom will fly its own Hub-1 space station in the future. UK regulator Ofcom is holding a public consultation on their proposed strategy for managing radio spectrum used by the space sector. Supporting the growing use of cutting-edge satellite technology to offer innovative services for people and businesses is at the heart of Ofcom's new proposed space spectrum strategy. The space sector is expanding rapidly, with the number of space launches increasing by almost 60% between 2017 and 2021. Companies such as OneWeb and SpaceX are deploying large numbers of new satellites, known as Non-Geostationary Orbit or NGSO satellite systems. These satellites move rather than occupy a fixed position in the sky. Meanwhile, universities and startups are using smaller satellites to test and trial a range of exciting new projects. Ofcom's proposed Space Spectrum Strategy sets out their priorities for how they will help the sector deliver even more services in the coming years, while making sure it uses spectrum efficiently. Thousands of NGSO satellites orbit the Earth constantly, tracked by satellite dishes as they move across the sky, to provide broadband to homes and businesses in remote locations. But these innovative new services need radio spectrum to work, and that's where Ofcom comes in. Ofcom states that its job is to make sure that the space spectrum is used efficiently and to manage risks of interference between different spectrum users. So their strategy sets out where they think they can make the biggest difference over the next two to four years, building on the licensing changes they introduced last year. This includes considering options for future access to UK spectrum that could boost the capacity of the satellite services, such as additional access to the 14.25 to 14.5 gigahertz band, as well as pursuing improvements to international NGSO rules. Earth observation satellites are playing an increasingly important role in collecting data on climate change. For example, they use radio waves to monitor changes in the natural world, such as the changing thickness of ice in polar regions. These systems also help other industries, such as agriculture, the emergency services and weather forecasting. Part of Ofcom's job is to help ensure Earth observation systems are protected from interference from other spectrum users. 
The rapidly rising numbers of space objects and proposals for mega constellations has led to concerns across the space community about the potential for space debris. Ofcom says that their role is to make sure that there is appropriate spectrum available for systems that support the safe use of space, such as radar systems that track the many objects in space. Helen Hearn, Ofcom Interim Spectrum Group Manager, said that while spectrum might be alien to some, we all rely on these invisible radio waves every day, and they're vital to the rapidly growing space industry. So, as the next generation of satellites beam down vital information to us, Hearn said that Ofcom is playing its part to help the sector continue its journey and to make sure that these enterprising pioneers have the launch pad they need. The consultation closes on the 24th of May 2022 and Ofcom aims to publish the final strategy later this year. For further details, go to www.ofcom.org.uk and head for the Consultations and Statements section. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the first two segments of this series on promoting your ham radio club's event, we covered the basic outline for a two-paragraph public service announcement. If you missed that show, check out our archived shows on the internet and stay tuned to This Week in Amateur Radio when we'll repeat our webpage address. So this time, we'll put all the information about our public service announcement onto paper and get it ready to mail to radio and TV stations in the area. We covered a sample PSA last time. Let's get out our notes and get the word processor running and get ready to enter the final draft. I would suggest a bold, large type heading which reads, Public Service Announcement. This will go all the way across the top of the paper. Remember, the final product must fit onto a single side of a single sheet of paper. This is very important as I'll explain later. Next line, left justified, type in kill date. This is the date that you want your PSA to stop running, which would usually be the day after the event. Next, paste in the text of your two paragraph PSA. Make sure it's spell checked and double spaced. Your PSA text should be a large, bold, simple text font. Now hit the enter key a few times and enter contact person. This should be the name, address, email, fax, phone number of a person to contact for information about the event described in the PSA. This person should be able to answer phoned questions about the event. Be careful whom you choose for this position. Be sure to include any relevant titles like club president for this person. Also include a formal address and contact information about the club submitting the event. I always like to add a five word phrase in parenthesis after the name of the club, like the Bowen County Amateur Radio Club, a not-for-profit organization. Take a look at your PSA sheet. It should be visibly obvious with a very quick glance what part is to be read on the air. The starting and ending points should be very obvious. The script must be grammatically correct and spelling perfect. You may punctuate for breathing marks if you know how to do that. It should also be readable in 30 seconds or less. Have more than one person read it timed to be sure it's the proper length. Remember, the burden is on you, so don't give the PSA manager or disc jockey a reason not to read your PSA on the air. Make it ready to use right out of the envelope. Any PSA with bad grammar, single line spacing, misspellings, or just a lousy read are easily passed over for others that are easier to read on the air as is. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. St. Patrick's Day is Thursday the 17th of March, and this will kick off a weekend of radio amateur activity to turn the airwaves green. One such event is the St. Patrick's Day weekend Flora and Fauna activity. Worldwide Flora and Fauna in amateur radio is a long-standing award scheme internationally and lists more than 26,000 protected flora and fauna areas worldwide, which are registered in their directory. 
The ERA Flora and Fauna Award Scheme, which is affiliated to the International Scheme, has been active since January the 1st this year, led by Coordinator and Awards Manager Jair Echo India 3 Hotel Golf Bravo and Log Manager Declan Echo India 9 Hotel Quebec. In ERA, there are over 250 areas defined by the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and you can find all the necessary information on eiffirl.wordpress.com. Over the four-day long St. Patrick's Day weekend, amateurs are asked to consider getting out and putting one of their local flora and fauna areas on the air. Certificates will be available for both activators and chasers for this event. Please advise Declan EI9HQ of your plans so that duplication can be avoided. Contact Declan by email at eifflogs at gmail.com. Another well-established activity is the St. Patrick's Day Award, which has many ERA, Northern Ireland and amateurs from further afield registering on their website, making it easy to find them during what promises to be a long weekend on busy HF bands. St. Patrick's Day stations will be running from 12 hours UTC on Wednesday the 16th of March to 12 hours UTC on Friday the 18th of March. For further information and to register as a participating station, go to www.stpatricksaward.com. And there's a particularly special effort by Charlie, Echo India 8 Juliet Bravo. He'll be signing as Echo Juliet 8 Juliet Bravo from Bear Island, that's IOTA reference EU121, from Thursday the 17th until Sunday the 20th of March. Activity will be on single sideband, Morse and radio teleprinter. QSLs will be available via the Bureau and also electronically via Logbook of the World. The 2022 running of the Armed Forces Day Crossband Exercise will be held on May 14th from 1300 to 2200 UTC. With more details on this annual crossband event, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report. A complete list of participating stations, modes, frequencies, times, and other details will be announced on April 1st. The event is open to all radio amateurs. Armed Forces Day is May 21st, but the Armed Forces Day Crossband Military Amateur Radio event traditionally takes place a week earlier in order to avoid conflicting with Dayton Hamvention. During the exercise, radio amateurs listen for stations on military operating frequencies and transmit on frequencies in adjacent amateur bands. Military and amateur stations have taken part in this event for more than 50 years. It's an exercise scenario designed to include ham radio and government radio operators alike. Military stations in various locations will transmit on selected military frequencies and announce the specific ham band frequencies they are monitoring. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. For previous announcements, the Armed Forces Day Crossband Test is a unique opportunity to test two-way communications between military communicators and radio stations in the amateur radio service. These tests provide opportunities and challenges for radio operators to demonstrate individual technical skills in a tightly controlled exercise scenario that does not impact any public or private communication. An Armed Forces Day message will be transmitted using the military standard serial PSK waveform M110, followed by the military standard wide shift FSK, that's 850 hertz RTTY, as described in the military standard 188-110A stroke B. The Armed Forces Day message will also be sent in CW and on standard RTTY. Once again, the full details for this event will be released on April 1st, 2022. American Legion Post 106 in Forks, Washington State donated a new repeater system to the Clallam County Amateur Radio Club, which co-owns and operates equipment with Forks Community Hospital on Gunderson Mountain. The American Legion say, during the Post's February meeting, the need for this piece of equipment was brought up and unanimously voted upon. It is quite expensive and necessary for long-distance communication. Joe Wright, KG7, JWW, is not only a member and officer of Post 106, but he is also vice president of the Clallam County Club, which shares use of their equipment with Ares, Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Wright and radio operators from Ares are also members of the Clallam County West End Emergency Management Group. 
Members who are involved in emergency management are not often noticed as they participate in meetings and special exercises in preparation to be of assistance in the event of disasters. In short, this is a very important piece of equipment now located on Gunderson Mountain and hosted by Forks Community Hospital. The location of this site and the people it serves is vital, and we are thankful for the chance to operate from there with other emergency management assets. The Clallam County Amateur Radio Club thanks the veterans of Post 106 for their generosity and support. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on the internet, on low-power FM stations, and on great repeater systems like the WB3GXW repeater on 147.225 MHz in Silver Springs, Maryland, serving all of Silver Springs and also covering the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. WB3GXW can also be found on Echolink Conference Server Node 6154. If you are a This Week in Amateur Radio affiliate and you would like us to give a free on-air announcement of your station's carriage of the program, please send us an email with the station location, call sign, coverage area, and day and time you air This Week in Amateur Radio, plus any other information you would like us to impart. You can send to the following email, w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That address once again is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. And finally this week, in one Ohio school, lessons on electronics theory and the electromagnetic spectrum have graduated to a level way beyond theory. On Tuesday nights in a high school biology room, members of the Columbiana Clippers Amateur Radio Club, K8LPS, can be found calling QRZ. Not only are they logging contacts, they're gaining a deeper understanding of the lessons about the electromagnetic spectrum taught at the school since 2018 by Columbiana Police Sergeant Wade Boley, and 8 ymx one of the school's resource officers. The club rig, which was donated by a local business, puts out 100 watts of power and the students are putting out immeasurable enthusiasm. Wade said that ham radio has also provided geography lessons since the students always look up any DX contact they've worked for the first time. The other map is provided by Wade, teaching youngsters the geography of electronics, how to read circuits and interpret schematics. Some students, however, are finding a roadmap for life. Katie Campbell, KE8LQR, told the Morning Journal News newspaper that becoming a ham has helped her with leadership skills, giving presentations, mathematics ability, and communications. She told the newspaper, amateur radio in general has helped me in every aspect of my life. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, k 